All right, um, Mark, could you give me a nonverbal cue if you can see the slides okay? Great. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And this talk is going to be about improving your child's anxiety at home, different things that you can do to be supportive but firm. My name is Dan Glass. I'm a uh, clinical psychologist and director of clinical training at Saska River Center. Today, we're gonna talk a little bit about anxiety and, and what anxiety disorders are, first of all, because that's going to be the focus. And we're gonna talk about two main approaches to dealing with anxiety at home, ways that you can deal with your, your child's anxiety, one of which focuses on the child and their behaviors, and the second of which focus on your behaviors and different approaches that you can take. So let's start with a little bit of basic info about what anxiety is. And when I say anxiety today, I'm talking about nervousness, tension, or apprehension, about some event that's imminent or anticipated. Okay, and that emotion is actually useful. And that's the reason we have it. It's because it has a function. And that emotion is to allow us to be vigilant of upcoming threats, things that might be in our environment that could hurt us, planning and preparing, getting ourselves ready, thinking through what would I do if that thing happens, if that um, wild animal jumps out of the brush, right? Preparing yourself physically, such as arming yourself if you need to, or you know, making sure that your family is safe. And anxiety also gets us physiologically ready for the threat. In other words, um, you feel that, that cortisol, that, that anxious feeling, you feel jumpy, and that way, if the wild animal actually does jump out of the brush, then you're more ready to jump straight into that fight or flight mode because your body was already activated. And that is what anxiety is for. Think about it. If we didn't have uh, a use for anxiety, it wouldn't be in our bodies, right? That's what it's for when it works properly. When I use the term anxiety disorder, I'm going to be referring to the um, inappropriate activation of the anxiety response, meaning that it, it happens in a situation where there is no actual upcoming threat thing to actually hurt you, or maybe the upcoming threat is small, but you have a lot of anxiety or your child has a lot of anxiety. It's often considered to be the case that anxiety disorders result in uncontrollable anxiety or anxiety that interferes with a person's normal function. The prevalence of, anx of anxiety disorders, rather, is around 7.5% in the general population, meaning right now 7.5% of people will have some clinically uh, diagnosable anxiety disorder, and around one in three people over the course in their life will experience some form of clinically significant anxiety, right? So fairly common thing. It's important to recognize that when we say anxiety disorder, we're not talking about an underlying explanation for why this is happening. It's just a label that describes what we see, right? And um, that means that there's no real clear distinction between this is an anxiety disorder and this is not. We have some, uh, we have a manual that sort of gives us these criteria. And if you meet these criteria, you have an anxiety disorder, but understand that that is an arbitrary distinction that, um, you know, psychiatrists and, and professionals have made not one that it sort of uh, describes an underlying difference in the mind of somebody who has an anxiety disorder versus somebody who does not. It's sort of an arbitrary cutoff that we use. As you know, anxiety can cause a whole range of behaviors, and, and here are just some of the ones that you need, would be likely to see in a child, avoidance of particular situations that they don't want to engage in, irritability, um, aggression. I, I hear uh, I hear an unmuted mic, by the way. I just wanted to pass it on to Mark to see if he can help. Um, irritability, um, aggression, children being very rigid about what they will and won't do, um, children wanting to control not only your behavior, but, um, you know, behavior of other people sometimes, uh, or, you know, being tightly controlled about what they will experience, what they're willing to experience. And, and a range of other behaviors that you're probably aware of as parents. Now, anxiety disorders don't tend to sort of 
fix themselves, get better. Once it is to the, rank, the, in the realm of clinically significant anxiety, you don't tend to see it just going away. However, anxiety disorders, if this is your main issue, you're kind of lucky in that it is a highly treatable thing. And therefore, those two facts that they don't tend to get better on their own, but they do tend to get uh, better fairly quickly when people engage in treatment is the best argument for actually engaging in treatment and, and trying to do something about it. So the, the gold standard for evidence-based treatment for anxiety is what's called emotional exposure or sometimes behavioral exposure. What you're doing is, of course, allowing yourself or your child to approach the emotions or the situations or the people that they would typically avoid. And just by um, approaching those emotions rather than avoiding them in a particular controlled way, the anxiety improves. Now, there are a few other treatments that are used sort of um, sometimes uh, in place of, but most commonly in addition to the exposure bit. And we're not going to talk as much about those today, but um, note that um, cognitive therapy, meaning working with the thoughts around fears, is very common when you're doing um, behavioral work for anxiety, as are relaxation techniques, you know, meditation and progressive muscle relaxation and all this sort of thing. And also talk therapy, which um, some people view to be actually a distinct thing from, from cognitive behavioral therapy. And, and the way that I mean it is just you kind of, you kind of talk through um, general things in life and talk through stressors without doing any sort of overt um, intervention. And sometimes that um, sort of talk intervention itself can help with anxiety. Okay, but we're going to be focusing on the emotional exposure bit today. Now, the, uh, the two behavioral approaches that I wanna talk about, the first one is going to be the child-focused approach. And um, you know, one form of that is individual therapy um, or exposure that you could do if a child's not in individual therapy. And the second form of that is going to, uh, to be the parent-focused approach. So the child-focused one is the one that we think about most when we think about anxiety treatments. And the parent-focused one is often used in conjunction with that. But the main focus of my talk today is actually going to be on these parent-focused approaches because they are also useful in isolation without the child-focused bit, which is not something that uh, people always knew. This is, this is research that's come out in the last, um, I don't know, seven years or, or, or less, pretty new research. Let's talk first about the child-focused approaches that you can do to reduce their anxiety at home. Now, because they're child-focused, it relies on the child having some level of willingness to engage in exposure to the things that they are avoiding, right? So this is when your child recognizes there's an issue, wants to work on it, and is willing to, to do some things on their own to get through that anxiety. It's very important that this child-focused approach, if you are doing it at home, be done with a child who wants to do it. Because if they don't want to do it, you're, you would be forcing them kicking and screaming into a terrifying situation potentially. And that would undermine your relationship with the child. So unless you're talking about a very, very young child, like a, you know, an infant or something, and you're sort of bringing them into a pool and they're kicking and screaming, then, you know, and then they get used to the pool, that's, that's a bit different. But if you got a kid who's seven, eight, nine years old, this is not, uh, um, I'm not suggesting that you should ever bring them into um, you know, a room full of uh, large, scary dogs or anything like that against their will. So when there's extreme sorts of fears or intense kind of presentations, um, I would definitely skip the do-it-yourself approach and, and go straight to a profession. So if you want to do this approach and if your child wants to do this approach at home, I just wanted to give you a sense of how exposure works because it's a fairly straightforward thing. And since a lot of parents and children sometimes are on board with this approach of let's go expose ourselves to the fear, I'd prefer that people know how to do it right as opposed to doing it wrong at home, right? All you have to do to begin with is just make a, an exposure hierarchy, a series of steps 
that uh, approach the, the greatest fear. So imagine if a child is afraid of dogs, then at the top of their list would be um, maybe to sit on the couch with the neighbor's dog, who is this very large kind of wild dog. And maybe um, on a scale of zero to 10, in terms of how much distress that would evoke, the child says that would be a 10, right? You can rate each step on your, on your ladder. So maybe in the middle of the scale as well, you know, I could, I could watch that dog from, you know, 30 feet away if he was on a leash, right? Maybe that's a five. Maybe at the bottom of the list would be um, a two. I could watch a, uh, a video of a dog running around and maybe a four is watching a video of a dog barking, right? So you start at the bottom and you go all the way up when you're ready to actually begin. So, okay. Let's start by looking at the um, at the videos or the pictures of the dogs online, and and work your way up. And essentially, what you're doing is letting the child get used to that threat, that um, uncomfortable but not necessarily terrifying first step, until they're ready to move on to the second step, and so on, all the way up the hierarchy. It's a fairly straightforward type of intervention, and it actually does not take very long at all, you know, sometimes a couple hours, sometimes 45 minutes, sometimes less, to actually work your way through a hierarchy and feel better about a situation that you were um, avoidant of, right? So maybe something that, that the child's been avoidant of their whole life, as, as long as they're willing to move forward. Now, the goal, of course, is to just experience the distress that they've normally been holding at bay until the stress, until the distress goes away, right? So the, the um, rationale here, if you look at this chart, you could see that the first exposure, the, the anxiety goes up over time. So you're looking at a sort of a, a bell-shaped curve where the anxiety is zero before the, um, before the dog comes out, right? And the dog comes out and then the, expo the uh, anxiety, I should say, goes way up high. And then if you allow the child to sit in that, um, situation for a while. And if they're willing to sit in that situation, the anxiety will come down over time because the, to put it simply, the stress chemicals in their brain temporarily run out, right? Just like you might run out of, uh, of saliva temporarily if you've been spitting a lot, right? To, to, to use a crass example, it comes back, but in the moment, the child will not be anxious anymore, and then the brain adjusts. So the second time you have that exposure, you can see the curve is a little bit lower because the brain has learned, oh, I guess that wasn't a threat. We've been acting as if it's a threat our whole life. We've been running away every time. Maybe it's not a threat. And so the third and the fourth time, you get less of that, um, that, ex that uh, sort of anxiety bump. Yeah. And the goal is to minimize any avoidant behaviors that the child does and any sort of emotion-driven behaviors. And what I mean by that is this, I imagine exposure working like uh, you're steaming vegetables on the stove, okay? In order to steam vegetables on the stove, you have to turn up the heat and keep the lid on. And what I mean by that in terms of the exposure is imagine that the heat is the anxiety from the stimulus. So you gotta turn on the heat, meaning you have to expose the child to the anxiety, let them sit around the dog. But it's not enough to turn on the heat on a pot like this without a lid on because then the pressure doesn't build up. And in the same way, if you let a child be around a dog, but you let them sort of flinch and, and all this sort of thing, right? It's going to take them longer to habituate, to get used to the anxiety because the brain is not learning, oh, I guess this isn't a threat. The brain is learning, this is a threat and look at all these things that I have to do to keep myself feeling comfortable in the situation and to avoid the danger, right? So. You need the exposure, which is the heat, and you need the response prevention, which is to keep those anxious feelings inside without letting them burst out like steam. And what that means, you know, is try to hold a relaxed position with your body that looks relaxed to other people, even though you know you're not relaxed. This is what you would say to the child. So child shouldn't be biting their fingers or, or you know, clenching the, the armrest of the seat or any sorts of things like that that might um, allow them to sort of let that steam out, okay? So if a child is okay with this and, um, and would like to, let's say, you know, get 
get used to dogs because maybe they want a dog for themselves, but they're afraid of dogs. So they want to do this with you. Look out for subtle ways of that, that they might be avoiding experiencing the distress. It could be, you know, uh, turning their head away. It could, they could be closing their eyes and doing deep breathing. Now that can be a good coping strategy, you know, out in the real world, as opposed to screaming and running away. But when you're trying to get used to anxiety, you know, it, it's, it's good once you feel in control of yourself to, to do away with these deep breathing things and allow yourself to fully experience the sensations in your body, right? So that you want the child to be able to do that. And if the child is making a lot of jokes or chatting or doing these other sorts of um, ways of letting the steam out, just say to them, you know, we're going to sit here for a while in silence so that you can really get used to this. And if you see them fidgeting or crossing their arms, you could say, let's, let's relax our arms for a little bit and see how you feel. There is no rush in this sort of thing, especially if you're working with your own child, you don't want to push them forward at, at a faster rate than they're willing to go. But the rule that I always make is, but we won't move backwards. So if you'd like to move toward the thing that you're concerned about, the dog, the elevator, whatever it is, you can, you can move forward one step at a time. And when you can't move forward anymore, stay right there. You don't have to rush, just stay there until you're ready. No rush at all, but we're not gonna move away from it, right? So just take all the time you need. And then when you're ready, take one more step. And if you can't take one more step, that's okay. Take a half step and so forth. All the time you wanna be praising the effort that the child is putting in. And you wanna keep checking in on the distress ratings on the zero to 10, you know, how are you feeling right now? It's an eight, oh, okay. So a minute ago it was a nine, that's good. You know, oh, it's down to a six, okay. Right, you don't want the kid to be, it's a 10, it's a 10, it's a 10. That's a little bit too much, okay. You can have them, you can have them step back if and only if you feel like they're sort of not in control of themselves and they're really, really, really unhappy. But you do want them to be a little bit uncomfortable. Okay, there's a difference there. It's not necessary, the research finds, that their anxiety rating comes down in that session, in that moment, right? So if the kid stays around the dog for an hour and says it's an eight the whole time, he never gets used to it, that's okay. You know, a lot of people thought, um, you know, before the research was done, well, that's a bad thing. It means it's not working. Actually, it doesn't necessarily mean that, right? It's okay to say it an eight the entire time. There's, you're still likely to see those reductions over time. And if and only if the child needs to have an external reward given, it's okay to include a reward, a little bit of a, a little bit of a push, right? If they need that incentive. However, if they're independently motivated to um, overcome this fear, then don't include the reward because the research shows that could actually undermine their intrinsic motivation to improve. Okay? Now, Sometimes you're going to need professional help, like if the child is really not wanting to do this, or if their ambivalence is such that some days they want to, and other days they really, really don't, and they're not willing to go forward, right? Or if you, as a parent, just know that you struggle to be patient with processes like this. Or if there are other more complex presentations, whether there might be other clinical issues like ADHD or you know, um, uh, an aggressive child, sensory issues, things like that. Or if, you know, if it maybe is straightforward anxiety, but it's a really complicated kind of presentation, you know, as opposed to maybe a more simple avoidance thing. Yeah. Or if uh, the exposures that you're doing, you, you feel like, oh, there's some sort of you know, risk associated with it. You know, this, any, any, any situation where you feel like, you know, doing exposure could potentially be traumatic or, or dangerous. Right? You shouldn't be doing any of those sorts of things that, you know, by yourself, you know, you not feel comfortable, right? So um, seek professional help and, it adds a number of different things that you're not able to do as a parent, right? Having the outsider perspective, having uh, a trusted outside party being the one who is sort of in charge of this process. So a therapist, a professional therapist would do some motivational work, uh, goal setting, um, education about emotions, learning coping skills, um, doing cognitive work, meaning looking at the thoughts behind these processes and sort of getting insight into what's happening underneath and, and treating all these other comorbid concerns. And, and that is what professional help adds to these sort of child-focused approaches. But I just wanted to let you know, in case you were interested in um, you know, informally working with a child at home to uh, um, overcome a fear or a, a, an area of anxiety, this is how you might do so. So 
at the end, you might have some more uh, questions about that process, and I would be completely willing to answer those. But first, I want to talk about uh, something that might dovetail with that, which is things that you can do at home to reduce the child's anxiety if, and especially if, they are not willing to make any changes to their own behavior. Okay. And this uh, part of the talk is based heavily on what's called the SPACE program at Yale. This is the acronym here, um, headed up by Eli Leibowitz at the, uh, the Anxiety Division of the Yale Child Study Center. A very excellent intervention, fairly new. It only involves the parents, does not involve the children at all, very minimally um, sometimes, but most of the time it's only parents that, that were doing this intervention in these studies. And at least this one study here, as well as the other small scale studies that were done, showed that in certain cases, it could be just as effective as actually working with the child, which is pretty impressive if you think about that. The child doesn't have to change anything about what they're doing. You don't have to ask them to change anything, right? But when you change your behavior, they're going to have to adjust. And, and that's what this is about. I'm going to recommend at the end of this talk, I'll put up the, uh, the name of the book um, if you're interested in this, and many of you will be, um, so you'll be able to, uh, to write it down. Just because I say that you can do this on your own and help your child's anxiety does not imply that it's your fault the child has an anxiety disorder, right? Not at all, because anxiety disorders are caused by a multitude of different factors. And one thing that we do know about them is that it's impossible to pin anxiety disorder on any single factor, right? So there's a genetic factor and a biological uh, sort of predisposition that you are not able to control. There are some environmental um, conditions that are outside of your control. There's a whole lot of things that are outside of your control. So we're not saying that any of this is your fault and yet you can still help. This type of intervention can be used for a range of different anxious presentations, including obsessive compulsive disorder, generalized anxiety, specific phobias, separation anxiety, selective mutism is, is where a child doesn't talk in certain situations at all due to anxiety. So a range of things like this. And critically, this is useful for any problematic anxiety issues, not only issues that rise to the level of clinically diagnosable anxiety disorders. So even if your child doesn't have an anxiety disorder, or if you're wondering, well, do they have an anxiety disorder or not? They're just anxious. doesn't matter. You can still use these same techniques. There are two kind of parenting pitfalls that um, that's easy to fall into at one time or another. And on the one hand is the demanding style. It's sort of the, the get over it kind of approach, right? Um, what's the problem? Get in there, like knock it off, you know, that sort of thing. And we're going we're gonna to see in a minute why that might not be as useful as parents you know, often think it is. And, and to note how sometimes some less egregious examples of that can also be considered demanding. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have the overprotective style. That is um, wanting to protect the child from maybe the anxiety itself and also the harm that the child is worried about, the thing that they're anxious about. So sometimes the parents, well, you know, I don't want my child to, um, to get bitten by a dog, right? So, that, you know, there's that. And then also, I don't want my child to feel anxious about getting bitten by a dog either, right? A very loving um, uh, approach. But as you'll see, can be not helpful if the goal is to improve the child's anxiety. And some parents actually go back and forth between these two different approaches, right? Sometimes in the moment or sometimes depending on how they're feeling. And I would go so far as to say most parents would have fallen into the demanding and the overprotective at some point in the child's life if they have a, um, an anxious child, right? So don't feel bad if you might have done some of these things yourself. It's more common than it is not. So as an example of the um, demanding style of parenting, I'll read you a little um, vignette about Zuleika. She's five years old. She has an intense fear of dogs that she's had ever since an excited puppy knocked her down at the park last year. She's gone to uh, a friend's house with her father uh, for a party, and the family has a small terrier. Zuleika keeps holding on to her father's legs and squealing, and she won't go play with the other children. 
Father says, don't be a baby, Zuleika. You're five years old. You're being ridiculous. There's nothing scary about the dog. Look at it. None of the other children are scared. Zuleika feels ashamed and embarrassed, but it doesn't make her feel any more comfortable that her father said this. She begins to cry, and her dad loses his temper. He says, fine, then we're going home. He picks her up, and he leaves the party in frustration. Okay. So that was an example of the demanding parenting style. Now, nothing he said was horrible, but each of those things that he said to her had the effect of invalidating her. You know, and we can invalidate children accidentally. And, and by invalidating, what I mean is implying to the child that the emotion that they're feeling is incorrect, that they should not be feeling it. And, and also implying that they should be able to choose whether to turn it off. Now, we don't have direct control over our emotions. Nobody does. Now, we can learn techniques to have indirect control over our emotions, but we cannot ever imply to somebody else or tell them that they should feel another way and expect uh, you know, a positive response to that, right? Don't cry. Like, don't be mad. Stop worrying. All these things, they're not useful, right? They're invalidating because we can't change how we feel in the moment just by wanting to. Anxious children can't just turn off their anxiety, right? And I think it's critical to recognize that. So the message that you're sending with when you adopt the demanding style is you're choosing to be scared, right? And furthermore, you're choosing to be scared and it is wrong to choose to be scared, right? And maybe it is true that, that, that fear is not an appropriate emotion because it's not actually a threatening um, uh, stimulus, but by saying it in that way, right? It's invalidating, it's not actually helpful. It's not helping the child approach it. That's the demanding style. Let's talk about the overprotective style. So Jennifer is a nine-year-old girl who has intense anxiety when talking to other adults. She doesn't speak to her teacher at school and won't respond when her friend's parents talk to her. Because her parents know how uncomfortable she gets, they've asked her teacher not to call on her in school. When people ask Jennifer questions, her parents answer for her because they know she won't. At restaurants, they relay her order to the server or to the clerk and speak for her because they know it's hard for her to tell them what she wants, even if she has to respond to a direct question such as, do you want fries or tater tots? She's asked her parents not to send her to playdates or birthday parties, so she doesn't have to speak to any of her friend's parents, and her parents have agreed, so Jennifer's social life is very limited. Right? So that's one example of an overprotective parenting, right? Very, very well-meaning, right? Because if you notice, they're, they're doing it out of love to, to help Jennifer. Right? Here's another one. Tony is a 12-year-old boy who's afraid of burglars breaking into the house during the night. As a result of his fear, he sleeps in his parents' bedroom instead of his own. He told his parents that if they gave him a baseball bat to use as a weapon, he would sleep in his own room because he'd feel better. However, once they did, he also requested they install a deadbolt lock on his bedroom door. And they wanted him to feel comfortable, and so they hired a locksmith to install the lock. Afterward, Tony said, I'll only sleep in my room if you get me one of those motion-activated security cameras for the front door. Okay. So this overprotective style comes from this desire which is a very laudable one to protect the child from any discomfort, you know, even temporary discomfort. Right? And it can uh, amount to removing obstacles from the child's life so they don't have to uh, feel that, right? And most parents among us recognize the urge to not want their child to experience any discomfort, right? That, that thought crosses our mind. Right? Um, and when we act on it in uh, too big of a way, it can lead to this overprotective style. So it comes from a place of love and caring, and that's the intention. But the impact is the message is sent. You can't handle stress. Right? You're fragile. Stress is scary. Anxiety is dangerous. All of these sorts of messages, which are objectively not true, um, but uh, which the child can really internalize. And the overprotective style results in what's called family accommodation. It sounds like a good thing, but oftentimes it is not. And what family accommodation is, um, is different ways that we avoid triggering the child's anxiety, ways that we change our behavior based on you know, uh, you know, differentiating from what we would normally do to avoid triggering that child. Now, almost all families do it if they have an anxious child. So, it is not a bad thing to recognize that you do it. It's a, uh, it's a loving, caring thing. However, the downside is that it can maintain anxiety. And once we change how we accommodate or, and how often we accommodate and the messages that we send when we accommodate, 
we can improve the child's functioning. So here are some examples of that. Um, if a child uh, has a, uh, a germ fear and asks you to please uh, take off your shoes and change your clothes out of your work clothes as soon as you get home and wash your hands for two minutes and then come downstairs and give me a hug, right? That is an example of, well, if the child asks, that's one thing, but if we do that, that's an example of accommodating the child's anxiety, right? Or if the child says, can you please help me check the house every night for, for burglars? So you go around checking for burglars, right? Seems caring, seems loving, right? But what it does is it suggests, well, maybe there are burglars, right? This is a, this is a reasonable anxiety to have, right? Providing reassurance if the child says, um, am I going to fail my test? And you say, no, honey. And the child says, are you sure? No, honey, you're not going to fail. Well, what if I do? Those repeated questions function to, uh, to make the child feel better in the moment. But in the long run, by providing the reassurance, you're um, suggesting that they're not able to deal with the uncertainty that um, is inherent in any human endeavor. Yeah. Um, avoiding certain uh, situations, and most, child, most parents know that we, you know, we sort of plan our lives around our children, but what can happen with an anxious child is we recognize we're avoiding things like, you know, going to parties or doing other things that would be maybe fulfilling for the child because we don't want them to be uncomfortable, right? Changing plans around. Um, now, dropping demands. These are all useful accommodations in certain situations, especially when you have a child who's unable to regulate their emotions um, because they have, let's say, um, executive functioning weaknesses and things like that. Um, and um, it's not to say that it's never an okay idea to do these things. Sometimes you do need to uh, make some accommodations to help a child out and, and help a child build some skills. But if the accommodation is simply functioning to you know, help them avoid being distressed and there's never any sort of exit plan for that accommodation, then that's when it can uh, prolong anxiety disorders and be a problem. So the child doesn't get used to discomfort and um, they are learning that they can't cope with anxiety. So the, the trade-off that the parent is making is one that is between the immediate comfort and the long-term improvement, at, at obviously the, uh, the expense of that long-term improvement, okay? So the unhelpful message that's being sent is, fear is bad, let's avoid it, as opposed to the more helpful message of, you can be okay despite fear, right? And, and when people don't have anxiety disorders and when they feel you know, uh, comfortable in life, it doesn't mean they don't have anxiety, it does not mean they don't have fear. Right? Anxiety disorder doesn't mean too much fear, right? too much anxiety. It means a fundamental kind of difficulty or unwillingness to um, accept the anxiety, to sit with the anxiety, to tolerate it. Right? That's the difference between an anxious, uh, sort of an anxiety disorder diagnosis and just a person who tends to be you know, just anxious by, by default. So here is the, the key to uh, responding. Instead of responding with a demanding tone, or responding with a overprotective tone, it's this balance approach. It's a supportive parenting style, and it includes both acceptance and confidence. Acceptance means, I accept that this is scary, and confidence, and I know you can handle it, right? So the acceptance piece uh, takes the best from that overprotective uh, parenting uh, style, and the confidence takes the best part of that demanding uh, parenting style, and it puts them together to, uh, to create a response like, I know it's hard, that's acceptance, but I know you can handle it, and that's the confidence piece. The child needs to have both, to feel validated and empowered, okay? So the child says, this dentist is scary, the dentist is scary. How does the parent respond? Here's a couple of ways. No, he's not, get in there, okay? So that shows confidence in your child's ability to handle it, but it doesn't show acceptance that the child actually feels the real anxiety, which they do. Or you can go home if you want. That's accepting of the child's anxiety, but it's not confident that they can handle it. And so the, uh, this is not the only correct uh, response, but this is one response that has supportive elements. But Dennis is scary, but he's not dangerous. I know you're afraid and I know you can handle it. Okay, so that is accepting and confident and therefore it's supportive. The acceptance is, I know you're afraid. And the uh, confidence part is, I know you can handle it. Okay, so in order to adopt this approach, I'm going to recommend the, uh, 
the book at the end of this talk, which goes through a, a formal process of really how to make these lists and how to do all this stuff. But you know, in case that um, you're not able to uh, to get the book, in case you'd like to try some of this stuff less formally, here's what you do: start listing all the parental accommodations, the family accommodations that your family does. It can be siblings too that do accommodations, right? Like, let's not um, play any music. Um, because, you know, uh, Sheila doesn't like it, you know, those sorts of things, um, you know, even siblings get on, on the act with that. Making a list of all the accommodations that uh, your family does, um, and your child can help. The child uh, often recognizes ones that you might not, right? And think about different ways that you react to this child that you don't um, with your other children, or that you might not if the child wasn't anxious? Or how do you change your behavior in ways that you would not have anticipated as a result of this child's anxiety? That's how you come up with all the different accommodations that you might do, right? And we'll, we'll hear some more um, different examples of accommodations soon. Um, and then after you have that list, create a specific plan to change your behavior, eliminating some, but not all the accommodations, because it's too much to say, I'm just going to not do anything, right? Your, your child needs to be sort of eased into this. So pick the ones that are the most bothersome, pick the, the symptoms that come up the most, and think about how you change your behavior, and start with those, the ones that are the most interfering, the most common, um, causing the biggest disruption in life. And make sure they're only related to anxiety, the goals that you pick, um, as opposed to, well, I'd also like my child to get better grades. So, you know, trying to fold in some sort of, uh, you know, improve grades thing as well. Too much. Only focus on things that are anxiety related. Um, you know, and it can be tricky if you end up with, um, you know, focusing on ADHD stuff instead of anxiety stuff. I know that ADHD and anxiety can be related, but you want to, to think about things that are related to the child's avoidance of particular things, as opposed to, let's say, their ability to kind of focus and, uh, and modulate their attention. Right? Now, this is key. You're changing your behaviors. Your plan is about changes that you will make. Your child does not need to agree to change theirs. They don't even need to agree with what you are doing. They don't need to agree with the plan. And that is the beauty of this approach. That's why it, it's um, uh, appealing to me. And that's why it's so useful when ch children are unwilling to engage in individual treatment or, or individual exposure. They don't have to agree, right? This is not uh, a debate. Um, they could certainly you know, throw in their constructive input. That, that's great. That would be great. But if they, if they reject it, that's OK because they're not changing their behavior. You're changing your behavior. I'm gonna keep hitting that point because I think it's, uh, to me, so, so eye-opening, right? So here's how to uh, remove accommodations. One thing is, um, you know, we're not gonna participate in rituals anymore. So, um, you know, if, if your child says, you know, I want you to check around the house uh, before bedtime, and say, you know, we're, we're not gonna be checking around the house before bedtime. If they want to check around the house before bedtime, to be consistent with this sort of approach, you don't have to, in fact, you shouldn't try to force them and, and tell them to stop, right? All you're doing in this parent-centered approach is you're not um, participating in it. A non-engagement response is a way that you respond to a child's anxious questioning or anxious comments in a way that does not engage with them. It acknowledges it, but doesn't engage. So imagine that um, anxiety um, going back and forth with anxious or reassuring, uh, sorts of questions and answers. It's kind of like playing ping pong with the world's best ping pong player, right? Playing ping pong with a devil, if you will. And no matter how many times you return the, the ping pong ball, they're always gonna hit it back, right? So you can try to hit it back faster, they're gonna hit it back to you. If you wanna stop playing, you don't just hit the ball back every time. You just let the ball go past you or you catch it or something. And the same thing is true if you want to disengage from anxious or worried questions, right? So if the child says, Am I going to fail my test? And you say, no, honey. Then you just return the ping pong ball to them. And they might return it back. Well, how do you know? Well, because you've never failed a test before. But what if I fail this one? This one's hard. You see where this is going. A non-engagement response acknowledges their uh, concern and sits with the fact that, you know what? It could be a problematic concern, but we don't have to engage in it. So the child says, am I going to fail my test? And you can say, I don't think so. You've never failed a test before. And you know, that's that's you know, you're answering their question, but then they're gonna kick it back. Well, what if I do? And you say, Well, that would that would stink if that happened. But that would be terrible. Well, it wouldn't be great, but 
you know, you're a really good student, right? So it wouldn't be that bad. And, and you're sort of not engaging with uh, the, the reassurance that you're trying to, uh, trying to ask for. I'll show you an example of that in a second. Okay, another, um, another tool would be actively ignoring um, the sort of problematic um, uh, reassurance seeking that they might do or you know, different sort of pestering or badgering that they might do. Active ignoring means you're not ignoring that child, you're only ignoring those behaviors, meaning that as soon as the child knocks those behaviors off, you return full attention to them. Right? This can be a kind of a tricky one to get right, um, get that balance. You're not ignoring them. You're ignoring the behaviors that they're doing. And as soon as they stop those behaviors, you've been returning the positive attention to them. It's important that you um, be consistent with this plan because the last thing you want to do is send a mixed message that um, you know, we sometimes can deal with anxiety and sometimes anxiety is too scary and we can't manage it because that is not helping at all. And it's important to be very specific about who is, who is doing the different parts of the plan, um, who's involved, when is it gonna happen, how is it gonna happen? I'll show you an example of that, okay? So after you've written this out, you're gonna share the plan with the child. You could, you could tell them, from now on, um, mom and dad are not gonna be doing X, Y, and Z. Right? Um, and, and you go through the whole plan. Now, they don't have to listen. Remember, they don't have to be involved in this process at all, but it's, it's great that, that you were trying to, and, and you should be trying to get them involved. If they don't wanna listen and they went, nah, I don't care, blah, blah. Give them a hard copy of the uh, of the plan, right? They can read it later, or they can throw it in the garbage. That's okay. You can just print out another one and leave it in their room, right? They don't have to accept the plan, okay? You did your best by sitting them down and talking to them and handing them the hard copy. Here's an example of a plan uh, written for Tony, the child who was worried about the burglars. A sample plan for Tony: Mom and Dad will say good night to Tony in Tony's room. Mom and Dad will go downstairs and clean up and watch TV until their bedtime. If Tony comes downstairs after this point for any reason other than an emergency, mom and dad will not engage in any conversation with Tony. They will ask Tony once to return to bed and then will carry on with their business without responding. Actually, those were points one and two. So number three, if Tony comes into mom and dad's room in the middle of the night for any reason other than an emergency, mom and dad will not make space for him on the bed and ask him to return to his room immediately. Number four, if Tony fights or argues when asked to return to his room, Mom and dad will deactivate Tony's smartphone and tablet for the next 24 hours. Number five, if Tony stays in the bedroom the entire night with the exception of bathroom trips as needed, Tony's parents will give him $1 the next morning to save up toward the skateboard he wants. Number six, if Tony asks an anxious question such as, what if somebody breaks in? Mom or dad will answer, then that would stink. If Tony asks, will someone break in? Mom or dad will answer, I hope not, but we can't predict the future. If Tony says, I'm scared someone will break in. Mom or dad will reply, I know it's a scary thought, but I know you can cope with it. If Tony asks more than one reassurance seeking question, mom or dad will not respond. Number 10, mom and dad will remove the deadbolt mechanism from Tony's door. Number 11, mom and dad will keep Tony's baseball bat in their closet until he has slept on his own in his own room for three straight weeks. Number 12, if Tony asks for any more anti-burglary measures, mom and dad will not respond. So that is a sample plan. Um, they might uh, want to break some of those up and maybe implement half of them now and, and implement some of the rest later. But that's the sort of plan to, uh, that you could do. Now, it is hard to see a child in distress. And that's one potential challenge, of course. Now, it's important to remember that you shouldn't be apologizing for this because you're not doing them any wrong, even though you know, they're, they're uncomfortable. right? If you had to get them dental surgery or something, it might be painful and you might be sorry that they're um, you know, in pain, but you wouldn't apologize as if you've done the wrong thing or hurt them in some way, you know, if they have sore tooth. What comes up must come down, meaning that when the anxiety comes up, it'll come down eventually. And short-term anxiety is not going to hurt them, it'll pass. Remember that it's gonna help them. And remember, you're asking them to get used to some discomfort. So you can do the same thing. You can get used to the discomfort of seeing them uncomfortable, right? It's only fair. Remember that you might think, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I, they're not, they don't think I love them anymore because you know, I'm ignoring their, um, their requests. Well, that's not true. Remember, you are acting out of love. Love is not giving children what they want. Right? Love is giving children what they need. And if they need to get over their anxiety, you are acting out of love. Another potential challenge, which I know that you're all thinking about, is well, my child's gonna argue or get hostile. Yeah. 100% um, it's something to, to think about, right? It almost always happens and it almost always gets worse. And that's fine because that shows that it's having an impact. 
Stick with the plan above all else. The last thing you want to convey to the child is that anxiety is so scary that um, if you get really scared, you know, we will, we will kowtow to what you want, we'll cave in, right? No, anxiety is always safe, even when it's very uncomfortable, even when a child gets, you know, rowdy. Don't have a debate about this, right? If you argue, then you are unintentionally conveying to the child that they have a chance of changing your mind, right? That's what a debate or an argument is. It's sort of going back and forth with arguments, right? If, if you keep saying, no, no, I'm not going to do it. Nope, 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 nope. You might think you're taking a firm stance, but as long as you're responding, the child thinks, well, maybe, maybe eventually we're going to move around to yes, right? Imagine if your child came home and, you know, asked for a, a Lamborghini sports car. Um, you wouldn't argue for too long before you would say, look, this is ridiculous. It's just not happening. Like we're not talking about this anymore, right? Um, it could be the same thing with, with this. You know, if, if you uh, were to argue back and forth the merits of you know, a 12 year old owning a Lamborghini, right? They're thinking, hey, you know, all I gotta do is find the right argument. So don't debate. Um, see if you can ignore, actively ignore their arguments or withdraw, remove yourself from the situation. You don't have to escalate the situation. You should not escalate the situation. Let's say a child is uh, you know, uh, trying to get your attention. And so um, they're uh, you know, yelling at you and you know, maybe they even knock some things off your desk. You know, it, it's very obvious why a parent would try to grab the child and stop, stop this, you know, cut it out. Um, but that escalates the situation and is likely to come to blows. You don't have to uh, give in to those attention-seeking behaviors, bad language, all these things. Store it away in your head, remember it. You know, later on, you, know, you can sort of talk about, listen, you, you, you can't call me those names, right? But in this moment, you've got to stick to the plan. Think about ahead of time you know, what, would ha what will happen, and what you will do if the child escalates in this way. You know your child. Give supportive praise. I know this is tough, and I know it's hard for you to, uh, to, to not, for me to not do this, but you're doing so great at getting through it. Look at you, you're getting through it. Consider having other people around, like a trusted friend or a neighbor or grandma, something like that, uh, somebody like that, um, because children are less likely to act out in situations like that, okay? And um, they are, uh, you know, they still might, right? But at least they know they have another um, set of eyes on them. And it also conveys that this is a serious thing, right? We're serious about this. Maybe uh, the child's going to tantrum or panic or argue for hours. And you know your child, sometimes this happens. Usually what's happening is you're attempting to calm them and it's actually keeping the, uh, keeping the beach ball up in the air, so to speak. It's keeping the, the, um, the, the anxiety going. So sometimes actually disengaging rather than arguing or even trying to make calming statements, um, uh, just disengaging is sometimes better because it allows them to regulate on their own, right? Instead of starting the anxious cycle over and over again. Um, it's okay to provide supporting and supportive or validating statements, um, you know, every every once in a while. Um, but if you recognize that it's prolonging the issue, you can cut those down. Now, this is a scary one. What happens if my child becomes unsafe? And some of your children might actually become unsafe. Um, the the important thing to remember again is this is not a reason not to treat your child's anxiety. In fact, it's going to make them better in the long run and going to reduce their chances of hurting themselves in the long run. If they become unsafe, if they threaten to hurt you or, or themselves or somebody else, their sister, for example, their brother, take it seriously always, but don't stop the plan, right? The last thing you want to have tell your child is, you know, you can get out of this plan if, you're, um, if you are unsafe enough, right? That's a terrible message to send, but understandable why uh, that would be the, um, the inclination. Um, bring in help. It, it can be a good time to bring in professional help, but um, uh, the uh, case that was given in the, the book is so good, um, I'm just going to sort of uh, describe it kind of as is, because um, I couldn't write a better one. Imagine a young child who, uh, whose parents implement a plan and the child um, picks up a kitchen knife and says, I'm gonna cut my arm if you don't you know, check the house with me. Um, now the, the parents you know, talk calmly to the child and are able to defuse the situation. And the next day, they, uh, the kid comes home and finds that grandma is there. Grandma's come from, from far away to, to be with him. And he's happy to see his grandmother, but 
she's come from a long way. And, you know, she tells him that I'm here because I know you're going through a really tough time. And I know that you did something last night that, that wasn't safe. So I'm going to be here watching you um, when you're home, when your parents are not home. And he says, Grandma, look, I, I didn't mean any of that. You know, I, I was just acting out. And she goes, I know. But we take it very seriously when you make a threat like that. And so you can see what's happening here. You, you know, the child might believe you're overreacting, but you are acting in a way that, that needs, to be, uh, needs to be done to keep them safe. That might include um, a, uh, you know, a 211 call to the mental health uh, services line. It can include a 911 call. It could even involve a hospitalization, um, uh, you know, attention-seeking uh, suicidal or self-injury attempt, right? All of these things can help a child recognize there are consequences and it's not a way to get out of the plan. It's only going to make sure that we take care of you because we care about you and we're unwilling to risk um, any, any sort of harm coming to you. And another uh, common example, uh, parents disagreeing on the approach, another common challenge. It happens all the time. You know, you know when are, are you and a spouse on the same page about every single thing, right? So this is probably gonna be one that, that can cause a little bit of friction. The key is, to, number one, remember, it's, it's going to happen more often than not, and pick the right time to discuss it, not in the middle of the argument, not in the middle of when the kid is arguing, and you're like, look, you gotta give him a break, you know, and then you go back and forth, and then the two of you are fighting. You've got to be on the same page and, and create a united front for the child. So pick a time later, you know, when you're both calm, you know, when you're not sort of um, uh, in front of the child and that sort of thing. Resist the temptation to blame the other parent or to blame yourself. Because remember, you have a common goal. There is no reason to allow this to slip into arguments or um, personal attacks or anything like that. Okay? Because um, all you have to do is, is acknowledge that we both have the same goal here. And it seems like we disagree on you know, how we're going to handle it. Um, and you know, if, if we can't decide which is the best approach, then maybe we can um, uh, bring in somebody, uh, you know, uh, a professional who might be able to help. After this, after you have, um, after the child has sort of gotten used to this, the fact that you are changed, you have changed your behavior for good and you're not going to go back and they've gotten used to it, you can then pick a different set of accommodations and repeat the process. You know, let them know about those new accommodations that you're going to be removing and, and so on. And there's a number of different avenues for, for professional help. Um, the individual therapy for the child, getting parent coaching, including the, um, the intervention at Yale, which is the SPACE program, which you'll be able to, um, to see more about. Um, I'll, I'll put up the, the book and I'll, um, you know, I'll let you know how to find that program. And um, you know, seeing a psychiatrist sometimes can help as well, um, you know, with, of course, with uh, children who are uh, really unable to regulate um, at, because they get so anxious, okay? So um, this is the book that I recommend. I, I read it recently and found it to be uh, so good. I'm recommending it to everybody. Um, the book is available through the public library's um, smartphone app, um, Hoopla, I believe it was, um, on audiobook form and potentially in print form as well, but it's a fairly inexpensive book. You could get it on Amazon if you want. Um, this is not the... Uh, the only uh, way to sort of get some of this information, uh, if you look up uh, SPACE, S-P-A-C-E, anxiety, uh, and Yale, you'll find their uh, center. You know, we're not a million miles away from there. Um, and you can check out the, um, uh, the sort of resources they have there. They, they have some, they do some work with parents, um, you know, on especially um, uh, tough cases. They even have uh, a resource list of coaches who, work with or therapists who are um, certified in this approach and can work with parents, just parents, to, uh, to form a plan like the one we've talked about today. So um, thank you. And um, I have uh, blocked off until 1130. I'm not sure if, we, if everyone has that amount of time, but I have plenty of time to discuss. <laughs>